And now I'm uh, happy to invite uh, Tom Fowler uh, to the podium. He comes from the UK. And Tom is um, uh, uh, Genomic England uh, Public Health Director, and uh, you belong to the project uh, scientific team. So Project uh, Geno uh, Genomics England is a, is a company which is, takes care of uh, 100,000 genome projects. A project, and, uh, and this is the topic you are going to share with us. Yes. Please, Tom. Floor is yours. So thank you very much for uh, in, inviting me here. It is, it is great to be here to talk to you. We, we had a presentation earlier on the um, uh, informatics and IT infrastructure in Estonia, and, and it does impress me every time I hear more and more about it, and I, I must admit to being quite envious. Um, I think it provides huge opportunities for you within the field of genomic uh, medicine. Uh, I, I'd just like to touch for a moment on the, the whole issue of sort of public understanding and public trust uh, about um, sort of genomic medicine. Uh, uh, and that's to illustrate it with a sort of a personal example, which is uh, my background is, is public health. And before I was made director of public health for the Genomics England, uh, I was working as a regional epidemiologist investigating infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, and that was quite cool. People were quite excited at dinner parties when I told them that I, I did that. They, they wanted, they were, it was something that was sort of always a topic of conversation. Um, now that I mentioned that I'm working on genomics, their eyes tend to glaze over, and um, it's, it's not quite the same reaction. Um, but I honestly think that this area of research, this area of healthcare, is probably the most exciting that's going on at the moment, uh, and therefore that's one of the reasons why I made that move. So I, I do think that we do have real challenges in terms of getting sort of public engagement around this issue, and I, I'd very much echo the, the words that, that actually people do think potentially the gene is, is, is a bad word. Um, so I would just like to go through and talk about the background of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, it was announced um, uh, 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 by the, the Prime Minister of, of the UK in December 2012. And actually, it's, it's very much of a uh, legacy of the, um, the Olympics in that at the, the time of the Olympics, the Prime Minister had various sort of think tank groups looking at what the future should be for the UK in different areas where they really needed to sort of uh, make a, a, a jump forward. Uh, and sort of doing the 100,000 Genomes Project came out of some of those discussions with regard to healthcare. Uh, I'd also like to sort of just sort of touch on, on why, why it is that this is the case. And, and really, it's, it's the reduction in cost. So, I mean, I'm sure that you've probably seen these statistics before, um, but the, the cost of the original first human genome was, uh, to, to undertake it was 3.2 billion. So if we were to do it at those prices, that would be quite a lot of money for us to do. Completely unfeasible for a healthcare situation. Uh, and yet when we look at what's happened to the price and the cost of whole genome sequencing, um, there's been a huge drop in terms of the actual pricing. So that, you know, the, the under the $1,000 genome uh, is, is now very much a reality, um, which makes thinking about how we apply this technology um, moving us into a very, very different space. So four, four main aims of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, so, so one is to bring benefits to our national health service, to the, to the patients, um, and, and that's a key part of what we're doing. The other, as, as has been said is before, is, is this very important focus on, on having an ethical and transparent program. Um, a key outcome needs to be uh, to enable scientific insights and discovery. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, I think you know, lots of people are recognizing that there are, are a number of potential uh, economic benefits from undertaking this type of work. Uh, and that's also a key, key aim of what we're, we're trying to undertake. So I'd just like to touch for a moment on the, the th sort of three areas that the 100,000 Genomes Project is focused on. So we're, we're very much uh, a hybrid model of both um, uh, healthcare transformation 
uh, and, and also research. So you know, traditionally the two are quite separate and this is something where it's actually very much being brought together and, and that's, that's brilliant because it has huge opportunities but also has, has a large number of challenges. Um, and so really that's where the, um, the focus, so the focus of the 100,000 Genomes Project uh, is, is mainly on three areas, uh, rare diseases, cancer, uh, and, and also there is a, a small section on pathogens. And the reason for that is that at the time when the 100,000 Genomes Project was conceived, it was thought that those were the three areas that would be most translatable into healthcare benefit. So it's, it's not that the other areas aren't thought to potentially have, have huge potential, it's just that in terms of building something that would leave a legacy where you would see sort of more immediate patient outcomes, it was felt that those would be the areas where you would actually see um, the, the, the biggest impact, where we were closest to implementation. So, and there's an important point, so, so rare diseases, when they were chosen also, r rare diseases are not rare. Um, uh, they're sort of, this is the, the, the rare is common comment, and I'm sure you must have all come across this before. But um, actually, each time I talk to different people, it seems that there are more rare diseases. So, uh, around about 6,000 have been quoted to me, but around about 8,000 have been quoted to me. Um, it's been estimated within the UK that around 3.5 million people suffer from rare diseases. Uh, and, and it's also assumed that the majority of these are genetic in origin. Um, when we looked at the project, I think this brings in um, uh, the, the point around why data is so important. Um, so we've undertaken power calculations for, <coughs> for our project, <coughs> um, sorry, pardon me, uh, based on um, the, the WGS 500, this was, was undertaken for us, that was looking at the impact of having good phenotypic data uh, on, on, on being able to do new gene discovery and new diagnosis. Uh, and here, you know, you can see that actually the better clinical data that we have, um, the, the more likely we are to find new diagnoses. And I think that that's a, that's a really important um, bit to hammer home, is that actually, in my opinion, the clinical data is as much a part of the whole genome sequencing test as the actual sequencing themselves. The two need to be brought together. So traditionally, you know, often in healthcare, a sample, something is ticked and they go off and they get the results and then the doctor puts those together. Actually, for whole genome sequencing, we're going to need to combine both sets of information to do with the analysis. Uh, and within rare diseases, of course, that is a real challenge because there are so many rare diseases and therefore one of the major aspects of it that we're undertaking is, is pulling together uh, disease models, uh, data models that looks at all the clinical things that we want to, to collect in this particular space, as well as linking it to the more sort of standard healthcare information that's available. Oh, and, and here, here is some comments about that. Um, you know, one of the things that we focused on is actually developing these models using the human phenotype ontology, so we can start to standardize the collection of some of this data so that it's a, a, in a more consistent manner. Um, and, and that's going to help us build our rare disease registries. I, I think how you pull together the, the, these sets of information is a challenge uh, across, well, across the world, really. Oh, oh, and I should just say, I think we're now on to 135 rare diseases. Uh, and so that does contrast, we are well aware, uh, to the sort of 6,000 rare diseases that are commonly sort of suggested might be out there. This is something that is a work in progress. Uh, uh, and we do very much recognize the scale of the challenge. Uh, I would like to sort of just say that actually this does, does make a real difference uh, to patients. So uh, we have, as, as part of our program, we, we've just entered the main phase now, but we undertook a pilot phase where we were uh, testing out some of our procedures and ability to process the data. And we have had some first results from that, um, which we've actually fed back to, uh, to patients where they've, they've had diagnoses. Uh, I think um, the, these, are, these are people who are particularly willing to um, 
uh, have gone have gone out in the public have been happy to talk about their experience and actually talk about the importance of sharing data for the benefit of everybody. They were quite passionate about it. Uh, the the family at the bottom, uh, uh, the father uh, was affected, uh, the, d the daughter is affected, but actually with the discovery of the relevant variant, um, there was a... Uh, 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 that daughter has, a, has a, a child of her own, and they know that she's not affected. So what this means is that that, that child doesn't have to have a lifetime of monitoring and testing. So actually there's huge preventative savings that's potentially available by the, the application of this data. And, and sorry, here, there, there's a picture of them. So it's just really important to remember that actually for us, the focus at the end is actually patient benefit. Um, however, I'm, I'm a good public health person, and, and I believe in the importance of looking at the overall cost effectiveness. Uh, and while this is by no means a proper cost effectiveness um, assessment, I think it is important to note that actually when we think about this technology, we need to look at the potential that it has in terms of addressing things. So. Uh, the people who, who uh, were affected by this, this disease uh, had a long diagnostic odyssey where for many years they were subject to a number of different tests, um, totaling around sort of £3,000 in cost to our, our healthcare service. And what's key is that they didn't actually get an answer uh, for why it was that they were affected. So we spent all of this money uh, and we didn't get an answer for them. Um, and yet, with whole genome sequencing underneath, uh, potentially underneath $1,000, you can suddenly see that this actually turns and upends the, the, the whole way that we might apply this. I, I would say, though, that I actually, I think one of the things about the 100,000 Genomes Project that's, that's really important is that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a project that's designed to shift where we are. It's to shift the system. It's to, to transform the way that healthcare is done. Uh, and therefore, um, what we see is um, the cost effectiveness of doing something in a piecemeal setting versus the cost effectiveness of doing something where you have a whole system shift and you've got the infrastructure to do it is very, very different. And therefore, when you're thinking about how you apply this, I think you should think about questions in terms of is there need for pump priming? Is there need for a big impetus to build the infrastructure to, to allow this technology to be effective? So the other area is cancer, um, uh, and we're doing sort of several cancers. Just aware that I promise not to take up too much time. I'm sure that you've seen all of this before. This is the equivalent power calculations for the ones that I showed you about um, uh, the, the, the rare diseases. Uh, and in essence, I, well, I get a headache every time I look at this. But basically what the message is, is that actually, you know, 100,000 genomes is not enough. To really find and drive new discoveries, we're going to need to look at international collaborations around whole genome sequencing. So that's something that we are, are very keen on. Um, I think that the important thing to just sort of state about cancer, so for rare disease, the challenge is the data, the challenge is the clinical data models that we, we bring along with this. Um, for, for cancer, the, the challenge is how do you process the samples? So uh, I don't know if you're aware, but with the cancer, what you do is you have a germline um, sample and then you have a tumor sample and you make comparisons between the two. And unfortunately, traditional pathology methods uh, where you take a tumor and you stick it in a, uh, a bucket of chemicals for 48 hours or longer uh, and then stick it in paraffin is not very good for extracting DNA. Um, and therefore, how you actually develop these processes uh, is a challenge that's not just facing us, but the whole world. But at the same time, it's also what we do know is we do know that we're needing to be much more effective in our processes within our healthcare systems to be able to do this. So we know that whatever the process is, just leaving it in a bucket of chemicals overnight is not going to be acceptable. We're going to have to have a speed of processing. So to move us to a situation where we do uh, molecular pathology whole scale within our healthcare system, we can't just allow the, the old traditional systems to continue. Whether or not that sort of molecular pathology is panels or exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, we need to improve our, our processes. So a big part of our, our main program is actually all of the healthcare settings that are involved with us 
developing and upscaling and improving their systems. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of makes it really both challenging and exciting because it's whole scale sort of re um, revamping our, our pathology services. And there's pathogens. I, I still love pathogens. Um, I, I, I've actually done an outbreak investigation with whole genome sequencing and pathogens, so I, I can say that I've done that. It's not what we're really doing in Genomics England. It's what's being done with Public Health England. Uh, they're taking forward that particular part of the pilot. But I would just like to say, you know, it is the same technology, and within uh, 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 so sort of some of the earlier studies that were done in Cambridge, looking at MRSA outbreaks, it was a human um, uh, genetics laboratories that did the sequencing for the um, uh, uh, for these particular bugs. So I would just flag. I think you know in the future we might need to think, and we talk, when we think about sort of how we make things more effective, the interoperability of these sy different systems, because we're not going to be able to have bespoke workforces for everybody, and, and a certain amount of centralization, well, it's, it's just important to think about. Um, so, Genomics England uh, takes a key coordinating role, but I would just like to say, you know, we're not the, we're not the only people by far. This couldn't be done, something on this scale, uh, without um, a, a lot of other partners. And, and our partners are, uh, are sort of outlined here. So there's NHS England and our genomic medicine centers, um, which is the patient-facing aspect of this. There's Illumina, which is our sequencing partner, and we have a partnership agreement with them sort of to help develop, um, uh, uh, develop the technology rather than a purely commercial agreement, um, because it's recognized we're, we're right on the edge here. We have a number of commercial partnerships, which is uh, companies that want to work with us to understand how best to use this technology. And we also have something called GSIPs, which are the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnerships. Uh, and that's basically crowdsourcing the academic and clinical research expertise, both in the UK and uh, also with international partnerships, to allow us to understand how to analyze this data and get the most out of it. Um, we're currently going through an establishment phase. Um, we, we have 11 NHS genomic medicine centers. Uh, just to let you know, uh, <clears throat> that covers most of England. Um, the two areas that it doesn't cover uh, are places called Yorkshire and Humber and Bristol and Avon. And we're currently going through process of <clears throat> procuring genomic medicine centers in that space. So we'll probably go up to about 13, possibly 14 uh, genomic medicine centers. However, a genomic medicine center comprises of collaborations between different acute trusts. So at the moment, we're, we're th th these 11 genomic medicine centers actually account for about 65 acute hospital trusts all working together. So this really is trying to embed this across the whole system. Uh, the others I've sort of talked about. Um, we also are developing a central UK data infrastructure, which is where this data will go uh, and, and be held, um, which will then be something that people access uh, to do the analysis of. Uh, and, and actually, sort of going into the, the specific responsibilities, going back to the sort of trust around this area, we've had to adopt an approach where we've said that we will hold all the data in a sort of a, a safe haven um, that's a secure infrastructure. Uh, we will feed back results to the clinical teams, um, but when it comes to commercial and scientific users, they will, they will access our data, but they will access our data through virtual embassies um, uh, where they come in and they uh, are, are able to use our data infrastructure. But this means that we hold on to the data. It's been described as a reading library, not a lending library. And while I, I truly believe that in the future, People will, will work to sort of more sharing of data. At the moment, it was felt absolutely essential for the public trust that we said that we would have this level of security in, space, in place. I, I love this diagram. Um, this diagram is what happens if you ask a bioinformatician to give you a diagram to explain what it is that they're doing. And, and it wasn't complicated enough, um, so they had to add another bit. So I'm going to just sort of wave my hands here and say, 
I don't quite understand what the bioinformaticians are doing in terms of the development of the pipelines, but I do understand the challenges that they're facing. But also, it comes back to some of the same basic principles uh, that we see through a lot of this, which is we need international standards around this work so that people can actually share and collaborate. The more consistent things can be, the, 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 the better. So I'm going to move quickly on before it scares everybody else too much. Um, Sorry, I've already mentioned that we cover most of the country. Um, what will we be telling participants? Well, we are, we're, I think, at the moment quite a novel project because we are this hybrid uh, NHS healthcare transformation and research project. And so because of that, um, we said to them that wherever possible, we will feed back um, main findings about the disease that you were recruited for uh, to you. Uh, and this is because it would be very strange to go into your GPs or your, your healthcare provider and say, I want to test for HIV, but don't tell me the results. You just wouldn't do that. That would be a waste of healthcare resources. So because this is firmly embedded within the healthcare system, um, we have to feed back those, they have to agree for the feedback of those results to take part. Um, however, with genomic medicine, with whole genome sequencing, there's a whole series of challenges about what you do with the rest of the data that's there. Uh, and and you know, this remains an area of, of, of a lot of debate. Um, we've done work with certain patient groups, and they want everything. They want to be told everything. In fact, actually, we've had to try and persuade them that you know, when we say there's a variant of unknown significance, this means that we don't understand what it means. Um, but what we've agreed to do is we've agreed to look for certain things which we believe are actionable within our healthcare system, where so something can be done about this, and if we find those, to report them back to them. Um, and this is optional, because this is additional to what they came to us for the, the first part. So um, whether or not at the end of the 100,000 Genomes Project, that's what we continue to do, I think is a different question. But I believe very strongly that it's important that we test this practically to see actually how it works. And then the final thing that we also feed back, um, should they opt for this, is uh, around reproductive choice. So quite often, lots of the people, at least with rare diseases, are coming to get whole genome sequencing because they're looking for a diagnosis because they've got an affected child, and they want to make reproductive choices about uh, whether or not they should... Um, uh, they should continue. Um, so what we have said with this is we're not doing carrier testing. We're not feeding back carrier testing. That's, that would be inappropriate. Um, but if a couple comes to us uh, and they say uh, we would like to have information um, that, that is applicable to our reproductive choices and they're both affected uh, and we can look for that by certain sort of carriers, uh, uh, certain diseases, then we will feed that back to them, but they both have to agree. Although um, actually, if you have X-linked or Y-linked diseases, and those are identified as well, which is specific to the individual and the individual's reproductive choice, then we'll feed that back. What we won't feed back is your individual carrier status. Um, and then, <clears throat> finally, clinical, well, clinical interpretation partnership. As I said, this is, this is our crowdsourcing uh, about how we actually analyze the data. Uh, so it goes into our embassy, and then we have this agreement, the GSIPs have been self-organizing, uh, and what's absolutely key is that they get free access to the data on the basis that they help with the clinical interpretation. And that's how we feel that we will really drive up um, uh, the use of this data. And at the moment, we're specifically working with how we can get our GSIP domain groups more engaged with our genomic medicine centers so we can bring that research clinical partnership closer together. Um, as has previously been mentioned, uh, healthcare education is an important part of this. And Health Education England are the people responsible for educating um, our, or providing the education and commissioning the education for our healthcare workforce. And they've commissioned several aspects of this, including a number of master's courses uh, that are there to provide a, a training and education for people. And of course, this will be key because actually it's the training and education that will leave the real legacy uh, uh, in terms of how to use this technology. Gene Consortia, 
Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. We have a, a large number of um, uh, uh, companies who want to work in a pre-competitive uh, space. Uh, what they really want to do is they want to work with our academic partners because they haven't fully understood how to make the most of this. So they see it as their benefit to actually be in a sharing space so that they can work together. We fully expect them in the future to want to go down sort of specific access routes and, and we will sort of charge appropriately for that. But at the moment, they want to share and work with people because they see that to their advantage. Uh, progress so far, um, we've got, <clears throat> well actually we've got over 5,000 whole genome sequences from our pilots, um, which we're sort of, is not the same as the main program, but we're currently analyzing that data. Um, from our main program, which has now started, uh, I think we're up to about 1,300 participants, so that's still in early phases. It's a long way to go. Um, the panel app um, is one of the other major things that we've done with a step forward. I think within genomic medicine, one of the key issues is the knowledge base and how we actually develop the, the, the knowledge base. Uh, and, and the panel app is a crowdsourcing tool for gene panels, um, which people get to download if they, they take part in, in looking at and assessing. So I, I really would encourage the sort of people who have an interest in this area uh, to sort of sign up and help us with this, because actually you, you get to benefit from it as well. And this knowledge curation and knowledge sharing is, is a really key challenge. Um, and there's the information about that. Um, so where, where do I see us in 10 years' time? Well, I, I was very lucky to have a um, uh, trainee genetics doctor, a genetics registrar, working with me. Uh, and she went to give a talk, um, uh, which I was at, to the epilepsy research and clinical community. And they said to her, you yeah, What's in it for us? What's to stop us just giving you the rubbish samples and keeping the best samples for our own research? And she said that the whole 100,000 Genomes Project is an opportunity to prove that you as a specialty are able to use this sort of uh, technology. So if what the clinical community does is not engage with this process, is not actually grasp it as a way for moving forward, they'll prove that they can't use it, whereas those that do can. So it's really, you know, in the patient's best interest that the different clinical communities in these different areas actually learn how to, to, to take part, to use this technology, to show that they can make the most of it. Uh, and I think that what we will see is, is more and more of those clinical communities actually getting to grips with it because it will be to their patient's best interest. Um, the final thing I'd like to say is that our comms team uh, have got an unofficial competition in that they're trying to get as many followers as we have whole genome sequences. So they're measuring the number of followers versus the number of sequences that we've got returned to us. So they have asked if people would be able to sign up. They would be very grateful because at the moment they're about a thousand behind where they should be. So uh, if you could all uh, sign up, they, 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 I, would, I would definitely get brownie points at home uh, if, if you did that. Um, that's where I was hoping to finish. Um, and am, am I roughly on time? Very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. We have a couple of questions there. Do you charge industry? Do I charge industry? Uh, yes, we do. Um, that's part of the, 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 the model behind this. Um, uh, uh, the charge that they have for the pre-competitive space is less than would be expected if they had sort of some exclusive access because they have to share the results of what they do in the pre-competitive space. Um, what's absolutely key is that any profits that are made from this, which I think will take a little while, goes back into the healthcare system. So, we are expecting to, to, to charge. We do have a, a focus on IP and how um, intellectual property works. But, but really, that's because we see this as very much an investment on behalf of the patients, and therefore we have a duty to make sure that we make the most of it. Um, the way you collect data, um, is this a satisfying industry? Are they happy with their data quality? Do you uh, have, follow some standards, some ISO or...? Um, 
So I, I, th I think, I mean, we look at the if you look at the stratified medicine program uh, in the UK that went before, the programs like that do drive up the standards of data. So uh, I, I think that it would be, um, I think it would be fair to say that that's one of the, particularly with rare diseases, because we're sort of starting from a standing start, that's, that's one of the huge challenges. Uh, and that's one of the important things about um, working through the NHS and the NHS systems, because it's about improving that. H however, I would say that we, you know, we believe that there's a very clinical argument about the benefit to the patients of providing good data. And it's up to us to provide that leadership, because you know, clinicians will, will not become engaged and provide this information if they just think it's for industry or for research. Whereas if they think that it improves the chance of a diagnosis for their particular patient, then they'll see the value of that. So that kind of looping back is going to be mm -hmm. really important. Uh, we're not there yet because we've not been able to really feed back whole scale large numbers of results. Uh, and so it's a, it's a challenge, but I think that that's the important thing to really drive. Thank you very much. And another question is um, being able to start uh, again today. What would you do differently? <laughs> oh, um, that's a, a, a really interesting question. Um, it stays anonymous. Yes, it stays yes. anonymous. <laughs> um, so the, the truth is that, that we're a, a political project with political requirements, and that means that we have to do things at a, a pace and a scale um, that is actually really incredibly difficult and, and in many ways quite, quite alien to a number of the NHS healthcare people who we're working with. So, so that provides a number of challenges. Um, it would be great if we had a longer time period to have done the planning but then we wouldn't have had the political imperative to really drive this forward to bring about change. So I think it's not what we have done different, but it's about the benefits and problems of different types of approaches. Uh, and the truth is, I'm not sure that if we didn't have this political focus of this great aim to, to go for, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been as successful as we had been so far. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't lots and lots of challenges around this space. Um, I think one of the other things, this isn't quite what we would do differently in terms of what we would do differently, but our, our consent forms were very, very robust because of concerns about them. And that provides a problem in terms of implementation in healthcare setting where time and resources are, are, are limited. But in some respects, a lot of the concerns that led to that complexity vanished the day the first person was recruited because the world didn't end and and you know it, it, it actually wasn't the most terrible thing so i think that people coming afterwards will be able to take that and 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 move forward and they won't need to do the same uh, sort of work that we had to do because we we've proved that it's okay to do this um so that's something that i would also not not do differently but but really wish that we were in a position to do differently right thank you very much uh, any question from the audience? Kas küsimusi on? There is a question. Marko Kirjum, Vice Rector for Research, University of Tartu. How the universities are involved into a great program? So you told about education, but what are other ways? Um, so within our GSIP domains, we have, um, I think it's over 4,000 people um, applied in terms of individuals. Uh, I, I, I've got to admit, that, well, that's one of the things that maybe we would have done differently. We didn't expect that level of interest from the academic community, and that did somewhat overwhelm us. So what that means is that for all of the research institutions, we have, um, we have representatives who are part of the GSIP domains. Uh, but what's one of the advantages about sort of looking at this in this way is that um, traditionally uh, you may have uh, different sets of people working in competition. The GSIP domains by saying research community in the cardiovascular rare disease area get together and form a consortia has meant that you've got much more space for collaborative working, uh, which I think is a real advantage. It's, 
wh where that will work, it will really, really drive forward research in the particular areas. And that's just not, not just about one institution, it's about several. But I do think that the future is this more collaborative approaching. So I would say as an individual institution, the more that you can get on board with leading the more collaborative approaches, the more that will probably put you ahead in the longer term. Right, we, we have got two, two additional questions. Uh, um, and these are, I think, before we go to the discussion, uh, the last one. So first is about uh, missing identity card solution. How UK is going to overcome this issue? Um, so w we're working with um, using uh, NHS numbers, which is our healthcare equivalent of this. Um, but it, 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 it is a challenge. I am envious of what you've got here. Um, uh, that linkage is... is but there's a lot of work in this area about bringing together different sets of data. So I think that we will crack it. It's, um, it'll mainly be through those specific identifiers. Any idea then how to link uh, genome data with uh, environmental data? Or um, um, is this a challenge? Is this, it, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in discussions with actually uh, some of the people in Public Health England. So we do have postcode data and, and things like that, that uh, sorry, that, that allows us to look at the, the, the location of the people. So a lot of the environmental data is often centered around where people live. So, so we should be able to link into that type of information and provide that as part of this. Um, and I think that will, that will be part of what we're doing going forward. Um, the other thing is, and we're, we're not there yet, is when you, you get into patient reported information. Um, so, uh, and this is something that is not a priority because we've got so much to do, but actually you can see where it's happening in other places is going to be key, where you get the people who are participants to actually provide the information about their environment and about their health. And that's going to be probably more accurate than a lot of the other stuff uh, and, and should help to address a lot of those issues. And finally, Lily asks, what about the genomics of common, common diseases? Um, so I, I think that um, one of the things about the choice of rare diseases, cancer and um, pathogens, was that it was felt that that was probably more implementable. But once you build an infrastructure that allows you to implement that, um, uh, then, then that provides all sorts of opportunities to provide other issues. So I, I believe that this will be a real boost forward to the, the, the common diseases and, and uh, how we can implement pharmacogenetics because it, it will allow us to practically consider how to do that and how we need to extend it. Uh, it's about where you start and where you build from. And for us, there are a lot of advantages in starting with um, those specific, most applicable diseases because it really allowed this emphasis on, on how you implement within the healthcare setting. Thank you one, once more, Tom, for your <laughs> profound overview. We have some uh, local <laughs> gifts for you. And now I Thank would like um, uh, Tom and Lisa Maria uh, invite you to hear, take a seat. I will stay here, please. So what we have done, we have prepared some uh, topics. Uh, the discussion has been, uh, I would say, so lively that uh, we have still left like uh, 12 minutes. Because, you know, Estonians won't uh, apologize to us if we uh, go into the <laughs> lunchtime. <laughs> Um, uh, however, uh, I, I ask from the audience uh, at the very, very beginning, uh, do you have um, sp some specific uh, topic you would like uh, our panelists to uh, address? If not immediately, then we'll start um, uh, the, uh, with a topic about the financing and about the sharing uh, resources. Uh, here uh, in Estonia, we well um, uh, talk about uh, issues that um, once we start with personalized medicine, then the money is taken away from some other part. You have um, established in England, Genomics England, and uh, in Finland, I um, understood that the National Operator for Health and Wellbeing will be the institution kind of uh, which will deal with uh, uh, data integration. And both, uh, uh, both organizations are 
um, demanding additional resources, how your um, let's say hospitals, physicians, uh, public in general, uh, uh, receives this idea that we will have now one additional uh, body to finance? Well, <laughs> um, our present government um, says that if you add something um, in the health budget, you have to take away an equivalent amount of money or tasks. It's, it's obligatory for us. Uh, so I think the emerging question is that how cost efficient is uh, gene testing, the, the common wording for that. Um, I had an experience when we published the genome strategy and we put the, as one of the examples a pharmacogenomics um, example about clopidogrel. And the only response I, I actually got from my medical experts was that that was all wrong. It is not cost efficient to test for that. Depends, of course, on the setting and so. Um, so I think we have to be very cautious and there is a whole lot of hype around these issues and not that much evidence. We have to be very honest. And I think the only way to, to handle this in the long run is that we, we collect information about the use, like, like a phase four type of trial, because it's already out there. People do these tests, they, they practice genomic medicine, and through the electronic health record systems and all other uh, combined registries, we have to continuously monitor what is cost efficient and how do people behave in, in real life. Right. And I think we have to start somewhere. My personal bias is that we actually have to introduce pharmacogenomics first, so that, that would be available on a national basis. Thank you very much. So this answers also the last question, what uh, was uh, for you after your presentation about uh, keeping eye on investments. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, so I think y y you're very right. Exactly the same sort of cost pressures uh, are there in the UK as well. I think that that's really a global phenomenon at the moment. Um, I, I think that there is a there is a difference though between what the costs are in a system that um, has the infrastructure to undertake this type of analysis versus the costs in a system that is sort of developing and working towards it. So, so part of the overall strategic aims of the 100,000 Genomes Project is to shift us to a phase where we have much more of that infrastructure embedded in a much more efficient way. Now, now whether or not that would mean, uh, I think it probably will, but whether or not that will mean whole genome sequencing is the way to go, or whether or not, say, for cancer, you're doing panel tests or uh, exome sequencing. Th those are, are questions that are, are open scientific questions. So I certainly wouldn't be saying it's going to be whole genome sequencing. We, we need the evidence base. But the, the truth is that we do need to make, say, for example, pathology services more efficient and able to use this technology. And how do you do that? Uh, uh, and, and therefore, what we're doing is we're doing this, this shift forward. So I, I, I believe that we will be in a position to much more accurately assess what these different options are after the 100,000 Genomes Project has finished rather than, than before. Um, but I, I, do, I do absolutely agree. These are, these are cost pressures and, and uh, and it's very difficult to make that justification. And a lot of what's being done um, in terms of our healthcare system of providing this is on top of their day job. So it's because the healthcare professionals believe that this will make a real difference to patients, that we have that buy-in, that they're willing to put in that extra effort, uh, which, is, which is quite an obligation on us to make sure that we then um, uh, make a success of them putting in that extra work. Thank you very much. Any immediate reflection from the audience? Um, I, I think we have uh, we could have one more question and then we um, close this session. And, and this question is not nice and it wasn't uh, invi in invented by me. Believe me, I'm just here to <laughs> bring <laughs> bring the word in. Um, the question is that, well, imagine you are, in, um, you are hired by Estonian government uh, to uh, implement um, uh, personalist medicine uh, project here. What would be your uh, 
first, second, and third advice based on your experience? Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I think first off, uh, patient and public trust is absolutely key to this. This is this is an area where there are there are, there are a lot of a lot of concerns. Um, uh, that's one of the reasons why um, we chose to focus on specific diseases because, of course, actually, uh, ironically enough, when you go and speak to uh, the, the patients with rare diseases, because there are often not um, treatments, they're desperate for their data to be shared with commercial companies. So, you know, they are, they, they, they are, they are doing that. So, so, th so the first is about that aspect of it. Uh, and I think that that's... That's very, that's very important. The second is that I think that one of the most exciting things about um, uh, the sort of genomic space is that um, it seems to be bringing research and clinical practice much, much closer together. Um, uh, and we all talk about that as the future, but it's in the UK, I can point at not just the 100,000 Genomes Project, but sort of two or three studies that went beforehand uh, where there's the clinical outcome that is a part of this as well. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I can tell you, when we've spoken to patient groups, they don't see the difference. It tends to be the professionals who think that these are different. Um, and so I would use this as an opportunity to push that forward as well uh, and really focus on it. Don't see it as a challenge, see it as a real advantage because this, this can be an example about how the rest of healthcare should be working in terms of bringing those together. Um, uh, and then the third thing, well, the third thing is difficult. I think the third thing to say is that you, you do need something of a scale with regard to doing this, at least at the moment. So the reason that we got the costs down to such an extent that made this feasible was partly because we agreed to work on a scale that, that meant that it was, was able to do that. So it's an industrial process. Uh, and the move towards making this an industrial process. And we, we all know, sort of in the future, There'll probably be further developments. We'll probably end up with close to patient care testing, but you know that's not where we are at the moment. Where we are at the moment is the ability to do quite a lot of samples, uh, and therefore I think that that's why it's important for you to be looking at collaborations and wider working to make that possible. Otherwise, the costs will be quite difficult. I think th this is uh, this is really really valid point. Uh, quite rarely we discuss about. Uh, how to implement all these inventions into the mainstream. And we can do this only with help of, of industry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, Lisa Maria, <laughs> anything to well, add? We, when I was listening to this fabulous presentation, I thought that, well, uh, Finland being a small country and UK, England being a much bigger one, uh, we actually do have quite different approaches. I, I wasn't aware of that before your presentation uh, to that extent. Um, my, my first approach would be to define personalized medicine, not solely as the application of genomic information in medicine. Personalized medicine is, is a wide concept. That means that we have to take the personal needs uh, of the person, uh, be it the pathology itself, be it her life situation, her ability to cope with the situation, support networks, ability to uh, tailor uh, the patient care pathway in a very personal way. Take the whole comprehensive concept first. It takes the application, it makes the application of uh, genomic information, that personal information, much more palatable to the big public and the politicians because you need the support of the politicians who in, at the end of the day decide about the health system and its funding. My second advice would be to have a uh, comprehensive uh, infrastructure for that. We, I think that the uh, idea of the genome strategy had its origins in the biobank community in Finland. I was told by the biobank researchers for more than two years that why doesn't the state do anything about um, this new phenomenon of genomic medicine that we need to have a national genome center uh, on top of the biobank system that we now have. And I think that we wouldn't have, we 
we would be in a much worse position to discuss this issue without first having the biobank and the biobank law, all the uh, health information registries, data archives, everything. Because otherwise then it becomes like small details, vignettes. Uh, so we had a little bit of a different approach to, to the application of genomic information in medicine. And uh, then you need to have a sound legal and ethical uh, base. I'm still a little bit hesitant about how much you need to discuss it in big public, have big headlines in the newspapers, uh, have uh, social media and so on, because it's, it is a tough area. But, but gradually make it more transparent, be patient and explain it in common language so that everybody has at least a chance to understand what it is all about. Because it's all about us, it comes under our skin. Uh, in everyday life, in the practice of medicine. There are many other things, but I mean, start with big principles. Thank you very much. Um, we have got two questions from my Inavik. So how would you define a failure of your respective approach to nationwide piloting of personalized medicine? I don't know, is it uh, for both countries? Question, yes, okay, let's. Um, shall I? <laughs> yes. So, 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 so I'm, I'm going to cheat slightly by saying I think we're already a success. Um, <laughs> and that's because when you look at the amount of work that has come out of taking a transformative approach, uh, so uh, I, I go around and do the quarterly reviews with NHS England, who's a kind of governance body uh, of our genomic medicine centres, and the amount of infrastructure that's being built around IT within each of those organisations, uh, the development of things like, for example, uh, in Oxford, uh, Oxford, uh, uh, the sort of main trust is working with their local delivery partners. They don't have enough skilled um, clinical geneticists in all of the sort of outer areas to have really meaningful MDTs, uh, multidisciplinary team meetings. And so they're actually working collaboratively to have that together. So we've driven collaboration within the healthcare setting that just wasn't there before. This is, this is brilliant. So the actual uh, outcome of undertaking this type of work really is driving it forward. Um, so I, I, I think that, that those are the sorts of things that we need to look at that will define success. And it's actually, if there isn't a legacy afterwards of that continuing, that, that's the sort of thing that I would class as failure. Uh, Clearly, there's a lot of political um, emphasis on a particular number, but a particular number doesn't equate to healthcare transformation. Thank you. Failure. Well, I'm, I don't like the word piloting here, because it's, it's already here. The pilot phase is over. At least if you look upon the world from the medical community's uh, side. I think we fail uh, if we cannot answer the request from the medical community uh, to make personalized medicine available to everybody. Uh, I have a clinical medicine and academic medicine background myself, and when I talk to my colleagues who now are actively researching this area, uh, and I see how impatient they are, because they see all the options, they see where we are going, they do horizon scanning all the time, and they get impatient. And if I'm really, really honest with you, uh, medicine is global. They look for that country, that region, in Europe, all over the world, where they can do that kind of research that they are motivated to, to do. And if we cannot provide them with the resources and the environment and the legal basis for this cutting edge research, they're going to go someplace else. And that's something I would call a failure. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and final, final question comes from Kuldar Taveter. And uh, the question is, uh, well, actually, um, he asked you to um, Mm, confirm that we are not talking only about uh, <laughs> genomics. <laughs> um, so I think 
Of course, I have a bias here in that I'm Genomics England, therefore I'll always tend to talk about genomics, which has been pointed out is not the only bit of personalized medicine, and I would never claim that. Uh, absolutely, this is part of um, uh, the, the decision support, the whole package, and I think that that's why I emphasized the need for clinical data as well as just the sequence. We do need to think more broadly about it, so I can, you know, I can confirm it's not just about the genome sequence. Lisa Maria, I agree. Yeah, I already gave my answer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it is not about genomics, but let's face it, I mean, that is the driving force. Uh, dear panelists, dear presenters, and also audience, audience, of course, thank you very much for this uh, very lively and um, nice uh, morning. Now we are going to uh, have a lunch and come back to 30. Paul Goldman, tuleme palun tagasi siia.